Vicki Stark. I'm the Dean uh, in the School of Workforce Development here at Grand Rapids Community College. And a little bit unique here at GRCC is that when we talk about the School of Workforce Development, we're talking about everything from a one-hour seminar course to an associate degree and beyond to the continuing ed um, units that we also offer. So when we look from a continuum of learning perspective, we offer, you know, from an occupational focus, everything from non-credit, credit, the continuing ed, certificate programs, and associate degree programs. So it really sits all within um, the School of Workforce Development. My name is Randy Thalen. I'm the president of Lakeshore Advantage, which is the economic development organization serving the Holland Zealand market. Our priorities really revolve around assisting our existing employer base, trying to help them find ways to continue to innovate and grow. We've got a real focus on innovation, bringing some of the best business ideas forward, helping bring those expertise or that expertise to more and more companies, <coughs> at least the Holland Zealand region, and certainly partnering up with our friends in Grand Rapids. Um, we also have a real push and a focus on technology entrepreneurship and making sure in West Michigan we can accelerate the number of technology startups, technology launches that we see. My name is Fred Keller. I'm a Chairman and CEO of Cascade Engineering. Uh, the other responsibility I have in the workforce development area would be as the workforce subcommittee chair on the Department of Commerce uh, Manufacturers Council. Um, Susan. I'm Sue Jackson, the business development manager for The Right Place. Right Place is a countywide economic development organization, and I'm responsible for business retention, expansion, and attraction. Uh, my name is Gabor George Burt, and I am a senior. Uh, uh, strategist with Blue Ocean Strategy, and as Eric mentioned, uh, I've been invited to uh, facilitate or, or host this discussion, so I will uh, say a couple more uh, introductory words about the whole process and Blue Ocean Strategy itself. At this point, just a, a small hint that it's all about uh, innovation, it's all about strategic thinking in a, in a new kind of way. I'm Jeannie Engelhard. I'm president of the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce. And we have three pillars that, that all touch on some forms of workforce development and, and issues of importance to business in our community. Um, our mission is to create opportunities for business success. And we do that through our membership, which are programs and events, through our diversity initiatives, which are, are very unique and very wide reaching and certainly impact uh, workforce development. And the third being our advocacy efforts and our work on behalf of business businesses to, to advocate for um, legislation and issues that affect them. I'm Wendy Lewis Jackson. I'm a program director with the Grand Rapids Community Foundation. Uh, the Community Foundation is the oldest community foundation in Michigan. We were founded in 1922 and we have an asset size of about 211 million. We make uh, around $7 million in grants every year in a variety of areas in the Kent County region, but workforce development, um, education, and uh, training are a part of our uh, portfolio. Thank you very much. I appreciate once again each of you being here. Um, I just want to take a moment, just a few moments, and, and just read uh, uh, Dr. Boyd George first um, bio. And uh, he's a leading expert in Blue Ocean strategy and value innovation. The highly acclaimed new approach to creative strategic uh, strategy formation and implementation, and the subject of international best-selling book uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. In addition to a BA degree in psychology from Amherst College and an MBA from NSAID in France, Gabor has broad business development and strategy formation expertise, working with a wide range of companies throughout the U.S., uh, the EU, and Eastern Europe. An engaging and dynamic presenter, Gabor is a frequent lecturer and advisor to numerous companies on the topic of innovation and strategies that lead to uncontested market space. In his engagements, Gabor draws on his close association with the two strategic gurus who founded Value Innovation and authored BOS for Blue Ocean Strategies, Professors W. Chan Kim and Renee Amabon as well as his own wealth of practice and diverse business experience. And I really, really feel privileged that he was um, willing to, to uh, share his time with us and on a pro bono basis, I, I do want to add. Uh, so we do sincerely appreciate your willingness to join us in this effort. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. 
I'm glad to do it. And uh, um, that was uh, overly generous of, a, of an introduction. Um, so what I'd like to do, and uh, the way that I envision this is to be a very uh, free-flowing, um, interactive format. Um, and I believe we'll have two more people join us, so um, we'll draw them in as well. Uh, as a way of getting started, I'd like to perhaps just say a couple of words about uh, this blue ocean strategy concept or how it's relevant to what we're talking about, how, how it will give us a, um, a framework for this sort of thinking. Um, perhaps maybe I should start with a question. And that question is um, recently in uh, Business Week magazine, a study was published uh, of a, um, the results of a survey that the magazine did in association with the uh, Boston Consulting Group. And what they did is ask uh, over a thousand CEOs of diverse companies and asked uh, about the importance of innovation as a topic for their strategic uh, uh, thinking. And my question is, if you haven't seen the article especially, what do you think was the percentage of responders, uh, of responses, who put innovation at least within the top three, if not their number one top priority? What would you guess was the percentage? High numbers. Very high numbers? Should be high numbers. Right, Probably should be high numbers. Probably low. If they're manufacturers, huh? they were definitely high numbers. We, we have one contrarian, so yeah. I guess, I guess <laughs> low. Well, I'm afraid you're going to say low. Um, no, I'm, well, don't, don't think what I'm, I'm going to say. I want to speak of your opinion. Very scary. Well, it, it is interesting. Um, Innovation uh, it was uh, ranked uh, by 75%, so three out of every four responded as one of the, t the key priorities. So either number one or among the top three. The other two choices were among the top ten or not a priority. And what was interesting is that the magazine does this year every year, so the trend uh, showed a sharp increase uh, from 2005. But what was perhaps to me more interesting that there was a second question, which was, are you satisfied with your internal process of innovation? So 75% said it's a very important thing for a company, one of the top uh, goals. And then the second question was, are you satisfied with the level and the process and the results? And almost 50% of the CEOs said no, they're not. And I think that brings to light, and it doesn't matter if you're a business or in academia or almost any organization, this notion of innovation is something that is very topical. Everybody talks about it. And to me, it's also almost an overused or abused word, sort of like market share, you know, that, that, uh, that people say. But when you get down to, well, what do you mean that you're innovative or you want to be innovative? Are you really that? then people start to falter a little bit and say, well, how do I actually measure that? Or, or what does it mean to be innovative? And, and how do I get there? And so Blue Ocean Strategy, um, the concept that I work with, has gotten, I think, the, the tremendous amount of attention it has because it helps to make sense out of this question. How do you become innovative? How do you define innovation? And and how do you go about doing it systematically? So what we have done, uh, beside putting out the book, which came out last year of the same name, is we have a team that uh, helps organizations around the world put that into action. And I purposely said organizations because we do a lot of work both with business as well as government. So. We have governments such as Singapore, Denmark, Korea, who are clients who are also using this sort of thinking process to uh, base economic policy, national economic policy on. And I just wanted you to be aware of that to say that one of the things that I think is most attractive about this whole approach is its universal application. So when Eric and I started talking about this, uh, I also got excited and thought that this was a, a good match. Okay, so one of the, uh, if we look at uh, uh, now the, uh, the way that this works, one, one of the things that, that we very much focus on is how do you take an organization
from looking at mostly at its competitors for strategic thinking as opposed to looking more at its target customers. And we say that if you do that right, your competition almost doesn't matter because you will be dominant in what you do or you will create a new market space in what you do. In fact, one of the most interesting definitions of a blue ocean company is one where you're not sure what industry they're in because they don't quite fit into any one particular thing that already is within a traditional boundary. And again, that you can say about any organization, whether it's business, academia, or, or government. And one of the other things that we probe and ask is what sort of answers do we get if we do not look at uh, existing uh, choices in a market, so we don't say, well, what is already out there? And how can we emulate that? But we ask, what are the alternatives? What else is out there that customers view as potential substitutes for what we offer, but we may never have considered it because it's a completely different industry? And another thing that we do is that we don't just ask customers for their opinion, but we ask non-customers. Because typically a customer is accustomed to understanding choices that he or she is being offered currently. So if you ask them, well, what would you like? How would you like it better? They're already uh, 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 stuck in thinking about existing choices in the market where they have opinions and preferences. If we ask non-customers who either have selected not to be part of our target customers as we've defined them currently or have never heard or been in contact with our offering, then we get responses and insight that is real innovation or the source of real innovation. So those are the kind of things that uh, we look at as a way of defining how we want to move. And um, I think that uh, we can agree that what we're really talking about is innovation. We're talking about how to become more relevant. And when we say that, to me, there is a logical distinction between saying that we want to be market driven, again, in, in which is a good thing, but to me, rather reactionary, because we look at what's in the market and we, we react to it. So we're being driven or driven by the, the market. So we want to take that and we want to go one step further and say we want to be market driving, in which we are driving, affecting the market. Okay? So I just wanted to throw these ideas out as we get into this discussion. And um, what I propose, in, because we have a, a great diversity in, uh, in, um, in opinions and, uh, and, and insight here, and we have a limited amount of time, is to do the following. First, I'd like us to jointly define what our goal is, what it is that the college wants to be good at. And maybe, Eric, you can help us with this. And maybe we can even put it on the board. So that could be our mission statement. What is it that we want? Okay. Second, I'd like to talk about who we think are the target customers, Okay. the target audience, target customers however we want to call it, but it's who are we after. And I would propose to you that in this case, there's probably going to be a main group of target customers, people seeking continuing or adult education, and there's probably two others, somewhat less important. The set of potential employers who will hire people after they had certain training, and also the education providers, people who are the professors who are transferring knowledge, because obviously they have to be engaged and, and interested in, in the success of any program. So first, defining what we want to be good at. Second, who the target audience is. And third, and this will be the major part of our discussion, I like to start to answer that question through six different perspectives. 
that we use with Blue Ocean Strategy. So I will introduce each one uh, uh, one at a time, and I'd like us to comment on that. So six different ways of thinking about the target customers and our goal where college wants to be uh, in a new way so that we can start brainstorming about some Blue Ocean ideas. And lastly, a definition. Maybe it's already clear to you, but when I say Blue Ocean, what I mean is those companies or those organizations that can uh, break away from traditional market boundaries and overstep accepted boundaries and accepted, uh, accepted uh, uh, obstacles in a way that they achieve two things simultaneously. One is that they deliver superior customer value, and two, they challenge industry costs. So we're not talking about a trade-off. We're talking about being able to do two simultaneously by, again, challenging assumptions and rearranging thinking to really focus in on what's most important and at the same time being willing and able to let go or reduce other factors that everybody has taken for granted. But, uh, but in the end, they are not real source of value to customers. And that's what we call Blue Ocean. And Red Ocean, of course, is the opposite of that, are those organizations that are stuck in incremental competition, that are looking at their direct com competitors and try to always be a little bit better than them. And they have certain set rules that they play by, and everybody defines innovation the same way. And it's a space that's very competitive, very cutthroat, and obviously much less potential. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, it's also one in, in, in our book, and that is Cirque du Soleil, which is perhaps you've all seen it. It's the it's a sensation in the, uh, in the, in live entertainment, and of course it fits that definition that I mentioned. Is it is it uh, clearly a circus, or is it a theater, or a ballet, or, or 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 opera? What is it? You can't quite put it into any traditional category, but one of the things that was a cornerstone of their success is their ability to challenge and let go the perhaps the most uh, important and the most quintessential part of a traditional circus, which were animals and very famous or top-notch performers, you know, the most famous clown, acrobat, lion tamer. Think about that. How can you have a circus without a, a famous clown or any animals? Is that blasphemy? Well, it turns out that it's not. And in fact, it's not just good business, but it, it was part of the whole rearranging process that made them not just a phenomenal success, but uh, they're one of the top international brands ahead of other brands like Volks Volkswagen, McDonald's, and even Microsoft. So that's just a quick inspirational example. So. Let's get started. Um, let me ask then this question, Eric, perhaps you can help us with that. Let's define what it is that's, that we're after here. What, it, what is it that, that we want to accomplish? I think what, what we want to, to hear today um, is, is diverse perspectives about, about Western Michigan um, um, and, and from a macro perspective. And as we, as we look at the role, that first of all, we look at economic development, we look at workforce trends uh, in the area, what um, should be the college's role in, in serving as a support system, um, as, a, as a funnel for qualified and competent uh, workforce to address the needs of this emerging and evolving um, um, <laughs> system in, in West Michigan? And uh, so as we look at, at learners, you know, as I said, you know, the mm -hmm. person who comes to the community college, it's, it's different. It's changing than it has been traditionally. So who is actually our, our customer and what are their needs and how do we, how do we identify um, or how do we match the needs of the industries mm -hmm. to those of the students so that when a student crosses a stage here or when a student completes a set of courses here um, that they have been equipped uh, to meet the needs of, of a walking into a, a particular industry, a particular business. Okay. Are we looking at uh, all types of education here, including credit and non-credit, or continuing, or are we focusing on one in particular? No, I think it's more open, and Judy, you may want to join in, in this discussion, helping us to, 
define it? I mean, I, th I think that I think a key element would be the non-credit. Um, okay. Reality is that does allow more flexibility. It allows us to be more creative. Mm -hmm. However, here at the college, because we are very learning centered, what we want to do is then translate that non-credit learning to credit instruction for that individual who wants to continue. So continue. I think okay. the original focus certainly can, you know, I, in fact, I wouldn't be bound by is it credit or non-credit. It'd be more what's the concept than the work that we need to do is how do we translate that to, to credit, non-credit, continuing education. I mean, I think the role that we need to play as the college is that let us worry about that. Right. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll fix that part if we, you know, if we can then help meet the needs. From okay. industry as well as great. The, so, the so that, that's a good answer. And um, if I asked you, uh, perhaps uh, again looking mostly Judy and, and Eric, um, what would your ideal slogan be in three to four years as a result of what we're doing? Would you have an idea? What would you like to be known as? What would you like to to uh, to boast yourself as? And if you don't, then we can come back to this. But it's a good way of thinking about it because it, it. Uh... Broadly, one thing that our president always talks about is GRCC being right for the times. Being so, right for the times. So if you look at that, based on this kind okay. of a conversation, is that how do we continue to keep ourselves positioned mm -hmm. to be right for the community from economic as well as workforce development? Okay, well, let's. That'd be at least one idea. Okay, being right for the times. And if you think of others as we talk, uh, uh, please share it with us as well. But that's a good start. So as far as uh, then, uh, let's uh, look at uh, who our target audience is. And I already threw out as a, uh, just as a uh, provocation, you know, uh, slight opinion to say maybe we're talking about three, um, three target audiences, one being the most important, but there's two other constituents that we shouldn't forget. So, please comment on this and uh, and uh, feel free to uh, um, you know, say what you think about that. Who, who do you think? How we, how would we define our, our our core target audience here? And would you also say that there's there's more than one? Definitely more than one. Certainly, the business community and individual students. Individual students. Um, I like to make that a little bit more uh, more defined. When you say individual students, what 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 type of, of students are we are we after here? I think um, many students come here um, to broaden their maybe high school education or to prepare them to um, access certain jobs in the workforce. So they're looking for a very specific. Outcome. Okay, so and those are the students looking to come to the college today. So, so the, you already said that broaden their high school education a specific outcome. So the, these are already people who are thinking community college. Is that could be? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, others, other opinions on this? You know, I think it's a real debate. Uh, I don't mean that to be. Negative, but um, the 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 objective of the student, I think, is to achieve the knowledge necessary to achieve a good living somewhere. I mean, that's why you come to the community college. You want to be able to have a job. You want to be able to be economically engaged. And it's uh, uh, obviously they need to be able to achieve skills that will be useful. So as the as the primary recipient of the services, the student is receiving those skills, but those skills need to be relevant to the business in which they are wanting to be engaged. And I think this gets into a longer dialogue about mm -hmm. the question of uh, uh, with so much information, so much uh, that could be learned by people, how do you focus that so that it becomes relevant to the occupation that they're pursuing? And, and that's where the role of business comes in, to be able to help shape that in a way that is increasingly difficult, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you further, since I think you're the most direct representative of the business community here, what, <laughs> what, uh, what would you say to that? How would you help shape 
um, prospective students or their learning experience so that they are most relevant to you? What, what's important to you? Is it a particular skill set? Are you looking for, for re or more of a comprehensive learning ability? What is it? We're getting off a little bit of what the target customer is, but uh, maybe uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure because, not sure. because okay. the second one uh, that was mentioned, Susan said already is business. So yeah. you're also a target customer, so that's why I thought to bring that well, together. I mean, I, my, my particular opinion is that um, students learn best when they want to learn. Uh, and that when they they want to learn is when they have been uh, when they individually understand what it is they want to pursue and that uh, to me is one of the big missing links and, and so that's where business can play a role that's different from mm -hmm. what many people perceive as if you just give us the, the, the kind of the curriculum elements you need we'll take care of the rest uh, business can really help in helping students understand where their passion lies. Mm -hmm. and once you have that passion understood and identified, then it's a matter of, of building the curriculum around that uh, that passion that meets the needs of business. That's, mm -hmm. that's a little different way of looking okay, at it. Okay, that's great. Uh, I would add another component to that because I think the passion is important in the curriculum, but it's a clarity around what specific skills are needed um, that students need to be thinking about um, much earlier so that they can kind of navigate and, and prepare um, is just as important. I don't know if we've done a good job um, translating what business needs specifically mm -hmm. to what we're looking for at the in the educational system, whether it be at the community college level or even earlier in the K-12 level. And, and when you say you don't know, uh, is that because that's what the statistics or numbers indicate? For example, people finishing, uh, getting degrees here, their placement uh, uh, success rates, uh, is, that, is that why you're saying that? Or? There's probably some statistical evidence um, that's important, but also just looking, and most of my work is in the K-12 sector, mm -hmm. so um, I focus more on what is happening there and what kids are or not uh, paying attention to or not being um, mm -hmm. exposed to. And what we hear uh, quite often is that the focus on where their passion is, what are they going to do as a next step, whether it be community college or you know some other kind of programming, um, comes so much later down the pipeline. And how can we look at um, kind of moving that up? And how do businesses mm -hmm. play a role in c making those connections earlier for students is uh, basically mm -hmm. the bottom line I'm trying to get at here. And clearly articulating what it is we need Mm -hmm. so that students can start thinking about that earlier than 12th grade. <laughs> earlier than 12th grade. Mm -hmm. that, that was one of my questions. What age group are we talking about? Because it's interesting, uh, in Europe and many countries, uh, uh, some of these decisions are made remarkably early. So that, like in France, mm -hmm. people, you know, kids are, are positioned and groomed for a certain profession, age 12. And, uh, and they follow that path. And so it's interesting when we're talking about uh, you know, how early do you want to um, make that decision or, or at what point can, can students or with the help of their parents make that decision. But, uh, um, and, and it's also interesting because I'll just say uh, slightly from the other perspective, shouldn't, how, how is that consistent? You know, understanding the relevance of what you want to do, finding that passion for that certain thing that you want to be good at. Um, how is that also compatible with the idea that learning should be an exploration process in which you may not be clear on what you want, so you go to find out what you're good at and what you're good for. So how, how are those two, uh, two compatible? And I, I guess I don't see it as contrary. I, I think we have to build a, a system that allows for that exploration, but at the same time helping those kids that are ready to focus um, be able to. Um, okay. So I don't see it as. No, I, 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 I don't either. And yeah, I think okay. that, that's, a, that's a good point. When you have businesses engaged 
and people have a glimpse of, well, if I study this, what would it be like to actually exactly. apply it in the exactly. business environment? That's, that's extremely helpful because that's really just a, a complete uh, mystery for most people who, who have a certain image or thinking that if they pursue this profession, this is what it would look like. But if they don't know, until they get there, it could be completely different. So I think that's, that's really good. I think there's another set of individuals, too, that could be, and I'm sure, is a growing customer base. We have sort of the kids coming out of high school looking at educational opportunities in the college certainly is a good choice. But as we go through this transition now, we have more people looking for work that have been let go and transitioned out of their job or companies relocating. Now you have people in their 40s, early 50s, who are looking for that next job that's going to carry them into retirement. And so I think from an individual customer standpoint, the college can serve a strong role in quickly providing training in a short, concentrated time period to get them back into a productive place. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's almost two markets. I'm sure there's people in between those two that are looking always to upgrade their skills. Mm -hmm. But I think you have people at the outset needing fresh skills, and you need people sort of at the other end of the spectrum needing fresh skills. Mm -hmm. Two different markets, two different population bases, but both going forward, both very critical. And, and the college already addresses the second group as well, significantly or, or not? Um, yeah, I think we make a, a real good effort to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, when I talk about this continuum of learning, what, we're, what we really are talking about from a philosophical approach is that every time an individual has a learning experience at the college, they become a new learner. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the role that that I would hope that, that we will grow and expand on is how do we help an individual translate that learning then as they then look for either different employment or, or a promotion or continued employment within an existing company. You know, there's all this conversation around the knowledge worker. Mm -hmm. Well, the knowledge worker, those skills are translatable, I would hope, to any industry, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's health, um, you know, whether it's um, human services. So. The, you know what what I think the part that we are striving to do is how do we really prepare that individual whether they're 18 or 40 to take what they know and then translate that particularly from an economic and workforce development perspective to employment how do we help the region I mean there's huge discussion right now about when we have these big layoffs the skills that, that individual has had for years how does that translate into a whole new industry right. and that that is a key that we you know, we would look for as much help as we could get because you know we want to be able to meet that need for the individual sure. but then obviously also for our region right and that's that's really why this is very relevant this sort of discussion let me ask uh, when we're talking about region how would you define the region from which your students come from and to which that your students go back to it, not, maybe the, the two are the same, but maybe not. So um, we know that people are. I mean, officially, Grand Rapids Community College serves Kent County. The reality is that that is not true. We have a real presence in Ottawa County. We are part of a of a, of a large Wired grant that talks about seven counties. From a community college perspective, we we partner with other community colleges all the time. So. We're not really limited by region because what, for where I sit is that people drive all the time anymore. You know, they, they might live in Grand Rapids, but they work out in Holland, so they might want to take a course or a training program at Holland because it's close to work, mm -hmm. not because of where their zip code is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we really try not to limit ourselves. The other thing is with online delivery now, we have international students. You can be in Australia and take a course from Grand Rapids Community College. So right. region becomes very fuzzy anymore. That's right. And that's why it's a it's an important question to ask um, because and how about um, um, when we're talking about being relevant to business are we talking about local businesses I mean and is that your focus to to promote and help local businesses primarily or do you mind if a student from Australia takes your course uh, and uh, over the internet and, and gets a great job in Australia. I mean, certainly we don't mind anyone that wants to take our course, <laughs> but, but the reality is is that students that attend the community college and graduate from the community college typically look for employment in the area. Okay. That is why often we'll have an employer come to us first because they know it's likely going to be the individual that stays here. It isn't that person that comes in 
um, for a two-year degree and then it's going to go home somewhere. They're typically the individual that, that are already invested in the community and stay in the community. So that's the piece that we really want to do is meet the needs for our local. Right. And local is broader than Canton County. So right. we do want to meet the need for the health industry, the manufacturing industry, you know, all of our different industries locally. Okay, so even though your geographic reach uh, right. can be pretty much worldwide, your focus yes. intentionally, strategically is, is local. Yes. Um, to what extent are your students continuing clients or customers? Once they come here, would they come back? And we mentioned about, Randy mentioned about this perhaps two-tier. Do you have any feel for people who come here for a uh, uh, credited degree? To what extent do they continue to come back? I don't know that I have statistics, uh, data at this point. Um, we know we have a loyal following, uh -huh. um, and we know often they'll come back for training and retraining or even continuing education units. I, but I, wouldn't, I don't have the stats right now to okay. say what that percentage would be. Right, but your feeling is that it's that uh, that it's it's high. In other words, if, if people need education and they've already been to the college, they turn back to you as a source. Correct. And and we serve a we do have a different role than a university. So we do offer different kinds right. of training and that's retraining right. as well as the traditional coursework. So I think that's part of it also is that mm -hmm. we do offer something different than maybe some of our our local universities. Okay, great. And I think Eric, you gave me the signal, right? Yes, one. Okay, uh, but so so let me ask one final question and then we'll we'll break. Okay, and that is, um, and we can break it down into. Let's focusing on the on the students. We can break it into two if you like. If I asked you, um, what do you think are the top six criteria in a student that's important to a student looking for a place of learning, and they're making their decision. Okay. And they're local students, as we said. They may be young, just coming out of, of high school, or they may be looking to retrain. What are the top six things that you think is most important, based on which they'll say, OK, I will go to this college, or I will get that learning from this source or from this source? I think affordability is one okay. that, that would rank up there, because many, many people know that going through the traditional university costs x. But going to community college, you have access at a, at a much lower cost point. And I think that's appealing. Certainly when you look at our, our region and you look at our community, there are those traditional students that go on to college and will go to a four-year school because they're not raised in the urban educational system. Mm -hmm. They're raised in you know, perhaps a, you know, one of the, the suburbs. So mm -hmm. there's a much higher rate. And I think the last rate was it, that I heard was what are we, like 18% go on to college now from our urban district? Mm -hmm. Any college mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or technical school. Okay, so affordability, okay. What well, it will cost up, I think, because a lot of your students will probably be employed either part-time or full-time, so to have the <laughs> flexibility to take classes that can fit into a, a bigger schedule that they have. Okay. Certainly employment opportunity and income um, potential those programs that offer that the greatest return on that investment is a big driver. And how does a student judge that? Well, as Fred alluded to earlier, the most passionate students are the ones who've done some research. They know where their interests lie, and they, they've done their homework. They know where that income lies, where that income potential is. Okay. But certainly that's a resource that I'm sure the college provides as well. Okay. Student support might be another factor in terms of how well the college provides assistance with um, academic and non-academic issues that students might be facing. And you, what would that be? Um, housing or, or placement? Housing, or? financial aid, placements, um, okay. particularly placements um, for more job experience or, or learning. Okay. Um, how about this, how about the social factor? I mean, to what extent is that important? Is it a place to? I I suppose it depends on the student. If you're a student coming here right from high school, then that social and peer group is really important. If you're someone who's working full time and picking up two classes because you want to um, get a promotion, mm -hmm. um, the social piece isn't as important. You come in to 
do your work in. Okay. You know, you're gone. How about reputation? That's important. How about uh, uh, proximity? You, you mentioned that uh, you know this idea that people are working around, but I, I'm just asking. So you know, just to uh, well, there's what, what else? transportation, which is another issue that we we deal with and we talk about in this community is not everyone has access to transportation the same way that those of us around this table do. So saying someone can drive is one thing, but I think the accessibility is also, it, it has to be tied into what, what public you know, transportation is available to mm -hmm. get people to and from either work to here or home to here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and the, so the reason I ask this question, and obviously this doesn't need to be a, an exhaustive list, but but it's, it's, it's a way of, again, trying to think from the perspective of the target customer. Well, we're talking about them, but if we put ourselves in their place, how would I make that decision? You know, I'm laid off from my job, or, or I'm just finishing high school, and I have some choices. I want to stay local. Mm -hmm. What do I choose? What's out there? And uh, um, you know, by not only uh, looking at what we think is their opinion, but then asking Asking them and getting getting to know that is, is an important uh, stepping stone in, 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 in answering this question. And obviously, a next step would be to say, well, how good is the college today at satisfying these criteria? How good are we compared to uh, what we may call is our competition today? Which may not be another college. It may be the internet learning. It may be University of Phoenix or, or whoever, um, or, uh, or any other source. So that's uh, really where we're going with this, is just getting an understanding, again, a definition of, of what our audience is. And what, what we'll do after lunch, as I threatened before, will be just to look at the, uh, these six uh, perspectives to, to, uh, to just brainstorm on ideas. You know, how do we think about this, this uh, situation in a fresh, fresh way? OK, so let's continue after lunch. Suggested our, our two new uh, uh, members. If you could just quickly tell us who you are. So uh, my challenge is I'm Greg Northrop. I'm president of the West Michigan Strategic Alliance, and, and since you guys have already been meeting this morning, I'm going to have to come up with something that's insightful without the benefit of your discussion <laughs> as it relates to this issue. But I'm up to that challenge. <laughs> um, I'm president of the West Michigan Strategic Alliance. I'm pleased to be here today to kind of help GRC. GRCC understand where they're going relative to their vision. Workforce development is a critical issue. Uh, we're fortunate in this region, I don't know if, if uh, Brett touched on it or not, but we won a WIRED grant, uh, which is a huge investment opportunity in our workforce development processes for this region. We're one of only 13 in the country, uh, so we have a great chance to uh, actually stand out amongst uh, the other regions of the, of the United States in terms of what it is we're doing with workforce and innovation processes. And, if we're successful uh, working with partners like you guys, uh, we will make ourselves the national standard or the best mark, benchmark standard by which others will measure their success. And so hopefully this kind of session helps get us to that position. Great. I'm Susan Shannon, and I am the Economic Development Director with the City of Grand Rapids. Um, I've been doing this job for 10 years. Our department is responsible for um, trying to leverage investment and job creation in the city of Grand Rapids, but we also work with a lot of uh, for-profit housing initiatives, uh, especially lately, do a lot of brownfield, renaissance zone, tax abatement types of programs, um, work mostly on older urban areas, downtown in the immediate neighborhoods, but we have a strong alliance with the community college which uh, is uh, represented on our Smart Zone Authority, which is about how do we create um, and also nurture high-tech kinds of jobs in the city of Grand Rapids. So um, 
very pleased to be a part of all of this this morning. I went looking for you at the McCabe Marlowe House, didn't find you, <coughs> took a walk around the city, and uh, finally found my way here in time to eat. So glad to be with you for the afternoon. Great. Well, welcome. And um, just uh, in one sentence, sort of where we got to before lunch, perhaps you were here at the end of it, um, was uh, we were looking at, uh, as a foundation, two questions. One was, um, what, it, <clears throat> what is it that the college would like to accomplish? And, uh, and we uh, heard a slogan from, uh, from Judy, which was, mm. <laughs> please. <laughs> I thought we would practice this, remember? Right for the times. Right for the times. Right, right, right for the times. As you can tell, the camera does not intimidate me. <laughs> Right for the times, um, and that's a, a good one just to keep in mind. Um, and then we're talking about uh, defining better our, our target audience, our target customer. And uh, we, have, in fact, have the results uh, behind us uh, on those uh, sheets <coughs> on the wall. And we left off uh, with the final question. Well, if we had to think from the perspective of a potential student, um, what would be some of the key criteria that they think is important in choosing this institution versus some of the other options that they have for uh, educational purposes. Okay, and uh, there were some comments uh, that that were made uh, in, right uh, during the break that I think I, I'll invite you to to really uh, um, uh, say during this uh, discussion to follow because I think they were very important. So I'd like to uh, switch gears and talk about now. Um, from six different perspectives, and we'll go one at a time, how you see uh, the college making uh, strides to, uh, as Greg said, to become an example of, uh, of, uh, of, of an educational excellence in an environment that has uh, several constituents, several different type of students, and there is uh, a lack of real clarity about you know, how do you stay relevant um, how do you stay relevant not just today but five, ten years from now? How do you how do you gauge that? So the first one I like to throw out and have your comments on is substitute uh, substitute industries or substitute uh, uh, avenues. And the idea here is to think about what other alternatives do students have or potential students have if they're looking to learn other than a community college or other than a college. Because once we look at that, then again we understand the thinking process of the students and can borrow some of the best examples from them. Just a quick one from the business sphere, Southwest Airlines, although it's an airline, defines itself or its key competitor or alternative as the car. Because their whole concept was built on the notion of, of ha having shorter term routes and they understand that the, the question that its customers are making, am I going to drive this distance, this 400 miles or 500 miles, or am I going to take a plane? So they created an airline that was adopting and borrowing some of the best, uh, some of the best uh, qualities that you have as far as driving a car, which was flexibility, multiple, uh, multiple uh, departure and arrival times, elimination of, a hub, of the hub and spokes model, et cetera. Okay? So when we bring this to this question in education, again, the first one being, what are the other um, alternatives, substitute uh, alternatives that students have for gaining that knowledge or education outside of a community college? What are your thoughts on that? I would think that they'd have, if, are you, is the question as an alternative to going on for a two year degree? No, they, it's, it's they wider than that. It? Right, it's okay. wider than that. I want to gain knowledge that's relevant okay. or that I'm passionate about or that I need in order to, to uh, get a job. How can I do that? Are, are, there, are there alternatives out there? And, and if so, what are they? Well, virtual education is certainly, I don't I pull it over, right? Virtual education is important because what it, we are, as everyone says, a global society. And how do you know that the jobs that you're training for today are going to be the jobs that are, are necessary tomorrow? What my 10-year-old grandson's going to do in his career, I don't think we know what that job is right now, but maybe by using some of the virtual um, tools that are available and doing some of that research and looking at best practices in other countries, 
there would be a way to, to sort of look at that in the future. But mm -hmm. that's a, that would be an alternative, right. I would think. Okay. There might be on the job training opportunities through maybe a mentor, um, that someone that you know that can help you with that. Okay. What else? And again, please, uh, this is this is purposefully an open question to to uh, um, think as uh, creatively as, as as you choose. I mean, you need to have other colleges and universities on the on the list. I mean, that okay. would be sort of there. There might be nonprofit providers that could effectively provide training opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you know, in the marketplace, you have employer-based programs uh, where employers are filling gaps that, that they see that exist in the marketplace to, to meet their requirements. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I suspect that that's a very competitive option because companies will do what they need to do to survive. And whether you're relevant or not is, is the critical question for that company. Right. And, and do you mean that companies more and more are, are establishing their own internal uh, uh, training purposes, not just uh, initial training, but almost a comprehensive training programs. Is that what you're referring to? Well, I, you know, to varying degrees, I think, I think they do uh, because they've decided what they need to do to be successful. And so, um, and I, at least for those companies that are large enough to have training capabilities and large enough scale in terms of understanding global requirements, uh, I suspect that there's quite a bit of that being done that we don't even know what it looks like. Why don't you know what it looks like? Because it, it's, it's not within the, the public purview in terms of the uh -huh. dollars and resources that are being spent to make it happen. Uh -huh. I mean, in part because it's a competitive intelligence uh, process. From an individual start, starting off, you know, I, I, there's no denying there's that type of corporate training taking place. But I think for an individual looking at substitutes, you know, I'm not sure that entry level job to get into a Gentex or to get into a Smith's Industries where they have extensive training programs. I don't know that you can get into those training programs without a credential provided by a community college or a university anymore. So, I, whereas I think there are, you know, if we break down the segments of individual students, I think that that internal company training hits a hits that latter segment more so than it does that initial student. I, I think that's exactly right. I think that the alternatives are becoming less and less for substitutes or other ways to enter the marketplace other than getting um, a two or four year degree. Um, so I think that those alternatives maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago were a lot of other kinds of things, apprenticeships, um, programs that were out there or you just could get into on a bottom level but now and now more and more what we're saying is that you need at, at least a two year degree to get into uh, at least a start that's true, there's an auto manufacturing company in the southeast area of the state, um, and they hire nobody unless they have at least a two-year degree, and that's manufacturing with sophisticated equipment on the line. I do think that maybe one other alternative is is uh, you become an entrepreneur. Right, and that's and now, absolutely. Now, um, I just was at a conference where they there are communities that are urging more of our high schools and community colleges and four-year colleges to teach entrepreneurism. Somehow we think mm -hmm. that entrepreneurism is one of those innate things you're born with to be an entrepreneur. And at least in a couple of the seminars I was attending, they were saying that's something that can be taught. And that those, because of um, what you were saying, Jeannie, about jobs are going to be changing and changing, the opportunities are I think more abundant to start your own business because you may have phased out of a job and then you are you know at a point where you might start your own business and uh, quite frankly that was a little bit of an eye-opener for me thinking about teaching entrepreneurism I think I always think that there are people that are born to be entrepreneurs and then there are people the rest of us <laughs> who want to work for somebody but indeed um, maybe we need to think about how how people make that choice and are they exposed to it? Maybe they saw their parents start a business, but are there other ways that you can inject that? Because we know that business startups um, are where there's more prosperity, where there are more business startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and, and I think that's, uh, 
that's one that I, I, I was going to also mention, because to me, this notion of having a, uh, um, a given structure, the educational system to four-year degree as, uh, as being a given, mm -hmm. I think it, it's being either challenged or challengeable much more today. Whether it's the internet, where you can just go on and, and start acquiring knowledge, uh, and that's also relevant, I think, with the upsurge of, of homeschooling in general, or this notion of entrepreneurship in which you bypass the whole educational system altogether, you know, perhaps inspired by some of the most famous businessmen in the world today who are high school or college dropouts, um, to say, hey, if they can do it, uh, uh, maybe I can do it. I have a great idea. I don't want to waste my time learning. I want to be doing it. So I think that's definitely definitely uh, uh, one that I would put up, up there as well. Um, any other thoughts on this one? So why don't we uh, go to the second and then maybe uh, we can review these uh, at the end. The, the second uh, perspective that we look at is something we call across strategic groups. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, as we already had in our discussion, we're, we're asking or, or answering the question, well, how do we de define our target customer, our target audience? And within that, what strategic groups are there? Whether it's by uh, age, by uh, location, or in any other way that, that helps us uh, uh, define them uh, more narrowly. And we already said that there's potentially two groups. One is people coming out of high school, the other uh, middle-aged who have uh, uh, either uh, lost a job or just want to be retrained. So when we ask this question, well, let's rethink about strategic groups. The idea is, well, how can you not just accept existing strategic groupings today, but think about maybe doing something that uh, appeals to more than one at the same time? Or how can you do something that creates a whole new definition of a strategic group? And even from this discussion before lunch, there's a huge gap of an age group, right? Between, say, the 20-somethings and the 40, 50-somethings. So is that really uh, you know, not, not uh, relevant to look at? Or is that potentially uh, a group in itself? Or as we know that the population is aging, is there also a market after the 50-year-olds? that may be relevant. And that's just one perspective, of course, that's just aging, uh, age-related groupings. So my question to you, when again, we, we want to kind of um, uh, think about uh, uh, more broadly about this issue, how would you approach the question of strategic grouping? What, what groups do you think may be uh, interesting or, or groupings uh, that, uh, that are not yet defined in, in education, <coughs> or not clearly or not well? Uh, may not be thinking about it in the right context. Uh, if you think about who is it that you're trying to educate versus who do we need educated to perform what work, maybe a more appropriate way to do your targeting. Uh, in, in, for example, in the context of Wired, we're going to try and define what are the, the emerging industry sectors, and within the context of that, what are the skill sets that are required to be successful within those sectors? Uh, and then within the context of that, do we have the capability to train people within the context of those skill set requirements. Now there's nobody that's smart enough, I think, to figure out what the emerging sectors really are. But you can look at your marketplace and determine whether or not you have the capabilities to potentially be successful uh, within the context of those sectors. And some of them we know, uh, life sciences and, and, and bio, uh, bio product processes, uh, mm -hmm. for example, are things that we're going to need to look at and have skill sets to do. So instead of thinking about who, who it is that you're trying to educate, you might think about the industries or businesses that you're trying to perform benefit for as it relates to educational services. Mm -hmm. And then you'll back into whoever the population is that needs to take advantage of that. That's very interesting. So you're, you're, you're looking at it from that perspective. And, and what are those industries that you're focusing on? I, life sciences is an easy one for us to talk about. Life sciences. We've got a huge infrastructure that's being invested in terms of research, cancer research capability. We're going to bring if we're successful at the MSU Medical School here. In most regional marketplaces that have been successful, there's typically there's a research function attached to a university that causes them to spin out new industries, uh, new creative thinking. Uh, and we're trying to build that base because we don't have a research industry in the 
a research university in the, in the normal sense. Mm -hmm. We're building capability uh, to get there. Uh, the question is, are we going to be able to be competitive on a benchmark basis to other regions that all want to be the life sciences center of the United States? Right. Um, okay. And, and our capability, our question is, can we build those capabilities to, to potentially be successful within that context? Okay. I think the other the other issue you got to think about is is your typically your I think your thinking is place based, and that your marketplace is within the context of whatever GRC sees as serves in this region. And in a virtual world, you might want to rethink where your target customers are. Yes, and because that's you don't need to be constrained unless you have some charter requirements uh, to serve only clients within this marketplace. Because our desire is how do we bring in intellectual capital into this market? But one of the ways to do that is to attract students to your to your curriculum mm -hmm. uh, with some expectation that if I take courses there, then there's likely some employment opportunities to go mm -hmm. with that curriculum base. But at least you've reached out and helped build your base against a broader marketplace. Right, and that's a, and I would uh, translate uh, the, uh, these comments uh, to say well, one is certainly industry uh, industry based strategic groups where you try to be you pick one that, that you want that you think is uh, is appealing or attractive and how do you become most most relevant to that and the other one this idea of geography or location um, one of the things we talked about before lunch was this focus on the local community and uh, it's interesting again just to raise that question is is the focus on the local community not to say that we're eradicating that but is that limiting or to what extent limiting the the uh, the role of the college and is there is there um, a way alongside that to to have uh, more geographic diversity introduced in some way is that benefit or is that is that a good thing so that's certainly another um, what what other thoughts on this and again we can return to the I'm still interested even in the uh, the age-based uh, distinctions that, that we've made because as I said I, I see that there's some huge gaps there that uh, we haven't addressed. I would say, I would say less than the <coughs> age base is the uh, uh, the pre-college or the pre-study uh, 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 education level, and uh, the ability that the abilities that they have uh, either to study or to learn, uh, and their exposure to those uh, that they've had in the past. Um, some students uh, graduate from high school and still are needing a lot of remedial work. Uh, so uh, rather than uh, rather than think of this in terms of age-based, I think it's much more important as to how much education they've had, what's their ability to learn, and, and, and how, what, what kind of uh, learning styles do they have. So you, you, there's really two things in there, I think. One is their exposure to it, and the other is their learning style. Mm -hmm. So how would you create or redefine strategic groups just based on that, uh, let's say, on style or exposure? Um, well, I mean, uh, we, all, we know that, that some students, uh, I mean, dyslexia is a good example of, of, of students having different learning styles. And uh, they, they, the, the ability to be able to have a, an understanding of what students' learning styles are and to be able to adjust learning patterns to their learning styles, I think, would be an important element mm -hmm. to think about. And, and uh, the exposure they've had to higher education or whatever, uh, I mean, I can imagine people that are, are um, uh, perhaps have uh, four-year degrees that still need uh, to be trained practically, uh, to be uh, practical education for how to, how to engage in the, in the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, lots, of, lots of students have gone through four-year educations and still don't have something that can give them a, a living job to do and uh, so that the, the, what they've been exposed to I think would be another section uh, or selection process. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to throw out another strategic group um, <coughs> and this comes from hearing from businesses who continue to hire more and more Hispanics as they're a large group of people coming into our community and they start off they tend to start off at entry-level jobs and because of the limited English speaking or maybe limited basic educational um, abilities are pigeonholed in those jobs. As we see more and more of those folks coming in and working in manufacturing and some health science basic entry level positions, 
it's going to be a big issue for us to be able to train them to improve their skills so that they have a career track as well. And I'm hearing more and more from manufacturers that they're hiring, in particular that they're hiring from this labor pool, um, who are very good workers, very hard workers, show up every day, um, but there they are on the bottom rung, and they're going to be people that we're going to need to lift up for future. I was going to mention um, that as well as a strategic group because it also is, the f today we, uh, we have a surplus of workers, but in 10 years we're going to probably have a shortage of workers, and the Hispanic population is growing at a much faster um, rate than the Caucasian or, and African American. And so as we move into that next era, or that, that period when we start to see a lot of baby boomer retirements, we're going to have a shortage. And this is um, a group that um, will provide labor, a, a larger growing labor base. So we need to make sure that they're an educated labor base. I think one principle that can apply for the college is being put to the test by an office furniture company in our area, where their big vision is to provide product or service no matter where work is being done. So whether it's in the office, the airport, the hotel, or your car, their long-term vision is to have something in that environment that you're using of theirs. And I think the same thing can hold true for the community college. You know, to Greg's point earlier about all the corporate training taking place, frankly, the community college or the universities in the area have a competitive or comparative advantage in teaching, right? That's what you do best. Companies make automatic dimming mirrors better um, than you can, and you guys teach better than they can. And so I think, you know, from a strategic group, if I were leading up the college, my goal would be everywhere there's learning taking place to have the college be an integral part of that um, and see if you can't take on. I, I don't think companies are clamoring to provide that kind of in-depth training. I think they're doing it out of necessity. And so I think there's an opportunity for the college to try to step into that and take on some of that responsibility. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a great, uh, great analogy, uh, you know, uh, in line with the, with the kind of thinking that, that I was, uh, that I had in mind as well. I mean, to say that, you know, look at, and, and you could say a strategic group or substitute industry, you know, what, what do we see out there that uh, that we can uh, we can borrow from? And, and if we look at uh, a manufacturer who who has a stated vision of being relevant in every point of time or every space, well, why can't that apply to the to a college or a place of learning? Anywhere that, that a person has, if, you know, if I translate what you're saying in, in, or the way I understood you say it, um, any time a person has time or inclination to learn during their day, during their their you know in in their in their uh, in their lifestyle, why can't we be relevant? Why can't we be there? And that's an interesting, a very interesting point because that leads you down a whole different path of thinking. There's another target group that, uh, and obviously Fred Keller's been big on using this term. Uh, it's it's the rework group. Uh, there's thousands of people in our marketplace that are 16 to I don't know 30 years of age that never graduated from high school, that are going to be a huge social responsibility for us. And based on the numbers that I've seen so far, it's not going to get any better uh, in terms of where we're going. If GRCC was able to figure out how to put that group of people that need rework in the sense of they need to be positioned to be employable, um, if you could figure out how to do that as a training entity in this community, you would you'd cause a huge uh, surge of economic wealth for us, um, and it's it's a huge gap that's not being addressed that I see by any any kind of sustainable process at this point in time. That's that's, that's great. Yeah, I think you know the um, the other one too that um, I think Fred was talking about is the pre college age student. We've got a couple of programs emerging in the community. One through the Van Andel Institute on Science and Technology. You have another one that is an outgrowth of uh, a model in Pennsylvania and I'm Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, thank you. And I can't what, what? West Michigan Center for Arts. Okay. And so anyways, my <laughs> point being thank you for filling in my blank mind. Um, that these seem to be programs that are targeting 
um, high school or even pre-high school kids and uh, I think can, it can be a place where a community college can fill a gap that's needed where there are ways to direct our kids into more specific kinds of programs, one being around our, another in science and technology, and where the community is looking for, and I know either through paying for it or through scholarships, have a way of introducing our kids to some really exciting things while well, they're still in that vulnerable age group. Yeah, they don't know what they want to do, but something needs to turn them on to education where we have an opportunity to direct more of our kids into science or to arts or, or those kinds of things. So I think that's, I, I don't know if that's a role. I remember, geez, 20 years ago when my son was young, there was a program here, a lighthouse or something like that, that I brought him to. And I think that engaged him in a certain level. That was a computer class. and um, So I think those are important kinds of things that our communities are recognizing that supplement to our K through 12 education we needed. I would like to support the, the issue around students that are kind of falling through the cracks that um, particularly with the new um, high school standards that are coming into play yes. this fall, um, if we think the problem is dire now, it's going to compound. Um, I don't necessarily like to call it rework, but there's re-opportunity that we need to provide for this group of students, and if the college can play a role in that, I think that would be Great. critical. So just uh, in the interest of time, because as you can see, these discussions uh, can and should cascade into uh, um, uh, you know, deeper, uh, deeper discussions, because this is exactly what, what we want to get to, is, is these issues. But let me, let me go on and, uh, in fact, limit the... Uh, the time uh, to maximum five minutes on the uh, on the third uh, uh, perspective, which I call across the chain of customers or our target customers. And what I mean by that is instead of saying that well we have uh, one uh, more uh, uh, amorphous group of uh, of customers, uh, we at least like to say that there's uh, three um, uh, groups within that one is the customer who actually uses what you're offering. So in this case, of course, the person taking or, or participating in education. Two, the person paying for that education. Okay, So the purchaser, so the user, purchaser, and the third is the influencer. So the user is the one that would be, in this case, the student. Second would be if, if it's a separate person or entity, whoever pays for it, and third is the influencer. Who do you want to talk to that will influence the decision of the other two to use your offering? So my question is that in this process that we're talking about, and again, let's do this just quickly, uh, who do you think are the, uh, the most important influencers? Who influences the decision of someone to come to the college or may so in the future? Um, and secondly, the separation between purchaser and user how relevant is that to this discussion? Okay, so any comments on this? Often it's the parent. Yeah, that's the Who often is the purchaser as well? Yeah. Teachers, counselors. <clears throat> You're talking peers. in terms of influencers and peers. So. And this brings into focus, because you immediately jumped on the younger generation, I think, is that you know, by all uh, standards or measures, this young generation seems very difficult to reach or communicate to. This is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, the big uh, complaints of businesses, right, is that how do you reach this young generation? They don't want to listen to anything. They don't watch TV in a traditional way. They, they, they tune the world out, right? They have their iTunes, and, and off they go. So. Um, so how do you reach them? Are there a f sort of focal points of influence where you can, you can give them the message that this MTV is what they should do? MTV got them to vote. Maybe they can get them to go to college, too. Well, there it's still an issue of content. And that generation or this generation is more driven by what kind of content you provide them. Maybe it circles back to your relevancy <laughs> point. but Right, and, and on the issue of... of uh, of uh, purchasing or whoever finances the education there again I would think 
One would be the, uh, the business community, if, if there is a relationship there of, of them uh, providing the, the funding. And second is, yeah, this idea of, well, what if uh, um, you have, uh, whether it's family members or, or even you know, financial institutions or whoever gives those loans, because they're, again, a point of influence or point of contact. Um, one of my clients uh, uh, makes uh, the, the world's uh, leading uh, pet or dog food, uh, uh, dog treat. And there it's very clear to see this distinction, right? The, the user is the dog, right? The, the purchaser is the pet owner. And the influencer are the, are the vets who tell the pet owner what to, uh, what, to, uh, uh, what to feed their dog for their health and their enjoyment. So this idea of understanding this relationship and then targeting these accordingly was one of the key points to the success of this, uh, of this company. And again, I think it's equally relevant here. So. It is, I think, a very important question, particularly in Michigan, where we now, latest surveys tell us that only 27% of parents in Michigan think that their kids need a higher education. So we have to get outside of parents being, which I would, I, I agree, I would, that was the first thing that came to my mind, it's the parents that influence. But um, if many of us grew up, thinking that a job without any college education was going to give us a middle class living then that's a little outside of our realm of, of thinking, then we need to find other influencers. So your, your question's right, and I think maybe we need to ask 20-somethings when they answer more than okay. my right. age, which is just a little over there. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, why don't we just leave it at that, at that for again, in, in the interest of time, is uh, is to is to really you know think about that. I mean, who, how do you how do you communicate? Not just to that strategic group, but of course the others that we identified. Now, the the fourth one is actually one of my favorites, one of the most fun, because um, it uh, lends itself very well to to real uh, creative thinking. That is complementary offerings. In other words. Beside what you're offering today, and as you define education or the type of education, what else can you offer that really addresses a larger need or desire? What else can you couple with education in the traditional sense um, that is more relevant or more complete of an association to the lifestyle of, of uh, the target customers? So. One of the things that I think uh, is, was, has been surprising to me is the sense of accomplishment, the sense of achievement, the sense of self-worth that comes from achieving uh, uh, some sort of educational uh, certif certification or uh, relevant uh, education that advances them in their job. Uh, it's, it's amazing how that uh, really changes lives, and I think you folks know that well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we hear businesses asking for, and I think Eric and I talked about this at one point when we got together, is the, the issue of, of critical thinking skills, the issue of teamwork, the issue of problem solving. Those are all issues that, that you have to deal with, I think, on lots of different levels in any kind of a job, but we don't teach that necessarily. Mm -hmm. The soft skills, I think, are, are it's important in many cases as the certificate that says, yes, you can now go out and do X, Y, Z job, because we all have to work together, and, and that's, that's a tough concept for people who have never had to play on a team. Well, mm -hmm. I think that goes back to what? Randy said what um, Judy said about how we collaborate as organizations um, to do more with less, and that's what's happening um, in industry. And certainly people are going to need to know how to collaborate and know how to get along um, because it's, it's different now. Um, and I think we may not know what the jobs will be five years from now, but those basic skills are going to serve a student well no matter what the job looks like. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and, but if I w were to open up the question even more broadly, because what you're saying is, is, is great, but it's still more educational focused. What I'm talking about, if, if you have students that come here, you're or either already living here or, or, um, or perhaps moving here for education, or even if they're virtually connected from other parts of the world, you have their attention. You have, you're, you're a big part of their life for certain amount of time, months or even years. 
So what else can you offer them, maybe beside or alongside education, that, that makes you even more relevant? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think as Fred was talking about growth, um, a sense of growth, a sense of accomplishment, it's education is one way to get that, but I mm -hmm. think if you look at it in a broader sense, it is about growing, and growing is a lifelong thing. It's not just something that happens at a certain stage in your life, although we tend to think of us as growing more in the younger years. But growth is a word that comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's very important. Yeah. The, only, the only thought that I would have is if you could find some kind of connectivity to what's going on within the, the field of interest of the person that you're training. Um, are you in a growing industry? Are you in a dying industry? Is there competitive pressures within history that would say, I need to understand this or that? Um, what's the reality of my success uh, in this mm -hmm. business over some period of time? So how can I make the, the educational experience relevant to what the marketplace is saying is either good or bad? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we seem to be a little bit like lemmings, you know, in the sense that uh, we watch industry cycles and everybody's running down the train to do uh, whatever. And then all of a sudden we find out, ooh, that's not a good thing. Right now we're running down the trail to do ethanol. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's debates about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing relative to its impact on, on uh, our ecology, mm -hmm. but um, the, the point is, is, is can you give them information relative to the success or failure of the, of the future of that industry and how mm -hmm. it might fit in in a global sense um, mm -hmm. so that the training's relevant? Well, let me try to take it a little bit different tact. I think there was a recent study, and I, for, I apologize, I forget the exact statistic, but they surveyed how many people actually have somebody they can truly confide in, have that tight social connect with, and I think it was one in ten. Um, pretty, you know, scary number if you think about it in this iPod world where it's all very individualized. And if you think of your student population, I suspect they're all carrying these iPods and they're very, you know, internet-based, very impersonal. You know, earlier somebody mentioned the social aspect. My first thought was, you know, community colleges without an on-campus living environment, it's not much of an option. But I wonder if that could be sort of a non-education complementary offering that they provide, and maybe this is happening, I'm not aware, but provide sort of that social outlet where you have courses around, you know, sort of the rock climbing, the mountain biking type of, uh, of opportunities, just from a pure social standpoint to connect people, reconnect people, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think this, uh, you know, coming right back where Fred started uh, about this idea of a uh, sense of accomplishment or, or sense of self-worth and, 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 and being, a, you know, a rounded individual, I think that, that there's a lot to be said for that because, yes, the world is becoming more and more uh, individualized and that sense of community and connection is is lost in that sense and and what what a better place than a college to reignite that um, you know two two other things would be sense of social responsibility environmentalism you know anything <coughs> like that 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 really uh, gives people a, a sense of uh, of, uh, of, um, of accomplishment or, 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 or self-worth in, in, in a larger sense so not too much of a jump from uh, the, the, the job. I think the, the, the college thinks of itself as providing skills uh, for people. Um, and, and it's maybe subtle, but uh, providing jobs. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you make the mission to provide jobs, uh, you may be looking at it slightly differently in terms of, of uh, making sure that we have the market research that says we have jobs available for those kinds of skills and uh, that we are going to, from the day they enter the college to the day they leave, we're going to be working on finding that job for that individual and helping them find their passion in that job. And maybe that's done, but that, 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 if, that were a, uh, if that were the passion, if that were the, the direction for the college, uh, boy, I think, I think things would diff be different. And it's yeah. just a slight, subtle change. All right. And I, like, I like the word passion. In fact, maybe that could be part of a, uh, you know, a a slogan variation of some sort, because I think that, that, that really speaks to the matter of, uh, of, uh, of the, the role of education. So let me just uh, make a quick comment on time. We're coming up on 1.30, which, was, uh, which is our designated closing time. Um, uh, what Eric has suggested is that uh, we can <coughs> we're, we're, we're going to go a couple minutes uh, later, but no more than five, so we're going to do the last two very quick, and then Judy will make uh, uh, 
make a couple of final uh, comments. Um, so that's uh, just wanted to throw that out there. So the the fifth uh, um, perspective is one we call uh, a cross functional or emotional appeal. And what we're talking about here is that most any offering um, is uh, is valued for one of those two or a combination of those two. It's functional so that it. It, it accomplishes at a good value what it says it will accomplish, or emotional, in which you feel a sense of connection, sense of identity or loyalty to it that is not rational, that you can't explain. And in the business world, this is a huge thing right now. I mean, just think of McDonald's slogan, I'm loving it. You know, it's just, uh, that's what every uh, company's out there trying to do, is how do you get that emotional connection? with your constituents. So even if you make a mistake, they still love you. They still, you know, look at iTunes. Look at, if you actually use it, because I have one. Now, I didn't buy it, it was a gift. But uh, I mean, I, there's so many things I, I, I dislike about it because it doesn't work. The batteries <laughs> don't work. Uh, you can't share music. It, it scratches easily. Yet, yet look at the, the, the fanatical following it has. It doesn't matter that it's not perfect. People love it. So my question is uh, on this one very quickly. Uh, should and can the college establish a real emotional connection with, with students so that they love it, so that you know it's, it's part of the way they identify themselves? Or is this more of a functional thing, so that we need to just be really good at what we do? Or, or is it, you know, where's the, where's the balance? My, my only reaction to that is if, if the GRCC doesn't have a passion, to use Fred for it, about what you're doing relative to these students, then, then you're probably missing the boat. And I, I don't know that you do or you don't, but, but the passion ought to be coming from you and then being conveyed to the students as something they should take when they leave here. So that when you do and you produce results for students, there will be that emotional connection. Mm -hmm. The passion, and, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, the passion at JRCC ought to be, we're going to be the best community college in the United States at producing students that meet the requirements of today's marketplace. I mean, that ought to be uh, your passion, however you coined the phrase, okay? Um, I, my, my response, I wake up every morning, I worry about what am I going to do to make West Michigan the best place to live, work, and play? And my chairman's not too ha happy, but I've added the word learn as a part of that mission statement. Because if we're truly going to be effective in creating intellectual capital, then we have to have a passion towards creating intellectually smart people. So if you, but if I probe that one step further, you want to be passionate. How do you, how do you unroll that? How do you communicate that? How do you get? How do you infect the students with that passion, and, and to establish that emotional connection? And again, I don't think we have time to answer that, but that that is the challenge. It, and that's, uh, you know, people are talking about the, the transition, you know, from it's no longer the knowledge economy, but the experience economy. So people are looking for experiences. So how do you make this the best experience people have in education um, so that it's relevant? And the last one is across time and trends. And of course, we can't ignore that. Uh, but uh, when, we're, when we're considering time and trends, we actually narrow it down more. And we say there's three, um, three uh, characteristics any trend has to meet for us to make it part of our strategy. One, it has to be directly relevant to what we're doing. Two, that uh, it can't be uh, uncertain, so that it has to have a, uh, a clear trajectory, so we understand where it's going. And, uh, and the third is that uh, it's not reversible, so that we know that it will happen. Okay, So for example, aging population, okay? I would argue is relevant to education. I would argue that it's irreversible and has a clear trajectory. People are living longer. So again, just maybe some final thoughts on, uh, on uh, any trends uh, that, that come to mind that you think are, are uh, meet all three criteria that, uh, that the college will and should be looking at. I don't know if it meets all three criteria, but we've talked a lot about this issue of place. And I think that's a really uh, important trend to consider is our definition of place and mm -hmm. definition of community is morphing. Right, where it ends and, mm -hmm. and it starts. Uh -huh. uh, my opinion, um, 
is that that the uh, the future of education uh, is going to have to become more customized, both to the individual learning styles and to the individual cultures of the environment that the employers are facing. Um, and I, I think that's the, that's the key challenge for uh, uh, for education. Those two areas. Okay. Any other final thoughts on trends? Status quo doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we've seen the high school degree become almost obsolete, right? More and more employers are requiring more and more. You know, I think if that trend holds, at some point the two-year degree really does. Is that still relevant at some point? I mean, that should be an issue long term. Mm -hmm. And then departing from that, I think the style of teaching, the, the more certificate, I guess maybe runs counter to that last point, but the style of teaching, the style of the programming to get it more condensed, more uh, timely, make that transition for the 45-year-old getting back into the workforce that much more rapid so they don't go to work just at Walmart to get a job, but they can in eight weeks, ten weeks have a, a new career path. So just timeliness and responsiveness. Does anybody here think that the uh, that the uh, the work weeks, as far as uh, forty hours or however one you want to define it, is going to be imminently changing or or reducing? For example, in France, the work week is now thirty five weeks, thirty five hours, right? Should, should we emulate the French? It's going the other way. Yeah. 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 Water hours and different hours and computers uh, get email messages at ten o'clock at night. So that's yeah. no good. So, uh, so, but no, but that I think that is a significant thing. Is is uh, is really, in fact, yeah. People are are working almost. Uh, you know, you take your office with you wherever you are, Connected anytime. Wherever you are, uh, you, you're working. And what does that mean for education as well? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In my, in my so. flip, the flip side of that, though, that, that I've heard some employers talking about, and it, it it I think it hits maybe doesn't hit the third criteria, but is that. The generation that's coming through right now that are the, you know, the young parents, they want the quality of life issue and they're willing to take less money to work less hours. And, and yeah, they may be connected with their Palm Pilot, mm -hmm. but it's the quality of life issue. And you know, we all, or many of us I'm sure, grew up with the model of, yeah, you work as many hours as you have to work to get the job done. I don't see that happening in, in, in many instances with the younger um, individuals that are, that are coming into the workforce, that not all of them are driven by the same things that our work ethics were, how we were driven when we grew up. Yeah. And it's different. It's they so put changing, their value someplace changing else. Work ethics. That's, so that's flexibility in, in, those, in, in a work environment is going to become very important. Mm -hmm. Great. And so, I think you talked about flexibility in learning, too. Learning at any time you have time to do it, yes. whether it's a tape or a CD right. or whatever, right, when exactly. you've got a few minutes Mm -hmm. while the baby's napping or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. That flexibility on the job and in your personal life and with learning is going to be key mm -hmm. to the future. Good. Excellent. Well, uh, let's, let's stop here. I very much appreciate everyone's uh, inputs. And as you can see, this was really more uh, throwing questions out, so, so understanding, you know, how to tackle such a big uh, uh, multidimensional question and, and what may be some angles to consider. So. Uh, obviously, this is uh, all we could hope to accomplish in, in such a short amount of time. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to, to Judy to uh, make some final comments. Well, obviously, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, you know really joining us today. Um, I don't know if we're right for the times, but I, I do believe that Grand Rapids Community College is committed to being the community's college, and I think it's evidenced by long history of partnerships and collaboration, but also evidenced by today. Um, we appreciate that you took time out of a very busy schedule and even found us, Susan, <laughs> um, to, to share your thoughts. I mean, I think that this is the, shows our commitment to working with all of you. Um, encourage you to help us keep the dialogue open. Um, you know, we have some natural connections and some that maybe aren't as obvious. And I guess I would just encourage all of us to continue to work together um, to really, you know, frame workforce and economic development for um, our region, but recognize that, that our region really doesn't have any boundaries anymore, as Jeannie really has reminded us. I um, also would like to obviously thank Gabor for his work with us today. 
Um, I think this is the beginning, and I would encourage us to continue this. Um, and again, it's just it's been a pleasure to uh, to be a participant. I know we could have talked a lot longer, had a lot more to share, um, and I certainly invite anyone who would like to um, you know work with us on either a specific project or or uh, you know even a global project like the Wire Grant. Um, you know, we really are very willing to do that. So thank you everyone for spending your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you.